because they've been in Rapid City almost as long as I have, and we've worked side by side, but never closely, I think would be fair to say. Um, he's a cardiologist, an interventional cardiologist, who's done uh, something like a thousand um, ablations or reroutings of electricity in people's hearts. Um, retired a couple years ago, if I'm correct, and uh, has uh, been interested in lifestyle, uh, what we call lifestyle medicine prior to that, and has been more interested in that since he retired. And uh, I began to notice Jose on LinkedIn and doing some talks about lifestyle and, and health, and I thought they were really interesting and wanted to bring them into our uh, little circle of discussion here. So um, without further ado. It's, uh, what's killing in 2023? And it's really not what people think. And we actually gonna be talking about uh, sudden cardiac death. That people think is rare, but it's not. It's actually the number one killer uh, of Americans. Uh, so we're gonna look at what is uh, sudden death, how common, uh, do we have any uh, warning signs that we you know, can do something about it? And uh, what can you do about it now? And you know, it is just this weekend, it was uh, for the, if you guys are into baseball, uh, he was, uh, it's an ESPN director, just uh, passed away uh, suddenly, uh, I think Saturday on uh, one of the playoffs in uh, I think South Carolina. Uh, I know he died suddenly, I don't know if it was, what was the cause, but it's everywhere. So let me talk about uh, Dr. Ed Zawada. Ed, uh, was the, my boss, and he hired me and brought me to Rapid City, uh, to actually to Sioux Falls first, and we worked together for uh, uh, four or five years when I was in Sioux Falls, then I moved to Rapid City. Ed was a, just a great internist. He, was, uh, he likes to collect board certifications. He's board certified in general medicine, nephrology, critical care, uh, nutrition, clinical pharmacology, you, you name it. He, he knew it all. He also uh, diagnosed my appendicitis when I was there. <laughs> and he, like, and then two years later, he diagnosed my kidney stone. Uh, because he was my doctor when I was in uh, Sioux Falls. And uh, regrettably, he just uh, died in 2020, uh, suddenly during sleep. Yeah, he just looked sleep and just never woke up. Um, and he's not the only one. There is the look at the news. This the Mr. Rakesh Jan Janwala is the Indian Warren Buffett. He started with 400 bucks and he got up to 5.8 billion. So uh, he probably knew something about business but he's still, uh, he is him on the right and is the prime minister. And so he died suddenly at uh, um, uh, age 62. Uh, let's move on. This is from CNN, it was November 2017, heart attack strikes, American Heart Association uh, president. Dr. Warner was the, President of the American Heart Association, and he opened his uh, plenary session um, in uh, uh, somewhere in San Francisco. Uh, and he said, uh, on the plenary session, he said, when my first son was born, and we introduced him to the extended family, he said, there was no old man in my family, none, period. He was, I think, 54 or 55. That night, he had a cardiac arrest on the hotel room, and uh, two, uh, one pediatric nurse and one uh, pediatric doctor uh, actually saved him. His wife was with him, and she noticed something was wrong, and she got out of the room and screamed for help, and they came and uh, uh, resuscitated him. He did fine. He's working, and, but it's just, for me, it's just way too close. They saved him, he did fine. But the bottom line, 
the point I'm making is this. Uh, what's going on? Even if you are the chairman of internal medicine at USD, or you are a billionaire, or you are the president of the American Heart Association, you're still uh, not protecting yourself from dying suddenly. And let's just think about that for a second. It, it is uh, very profound because I can tell you, we're very good at what we do in terms of putting out the fires, treating the heart attacks, treating the strokes, the peripheral vascular disease, but we are failing miserably in uh, preventing and avoiding these fires. Sudden death is really a death that occurs from a heart cause within one hour of onset of symptoms. So you find, and one hour later you're gone. And it's actually 50% of all cardiac deaths. And it's not really a heart attack. A heart attack is when one of the blockage in the arteries in the heart uh, happens, the artery gets occluded and downstream, that part of the heart muscle is gonna die unless you, uh, somebody's gonna help you go in to the cat lab and you open that blockage up uh, quickly. And at that time we say uh, muscle is, is time. Time is muscle because as the time goes, your heart, that part of the heart is going to die. It's going to uh, become a scar and it's not going to be able to do what the heart's supposed to do that is pump. And 80% uh, of other hospital cardiac arrests to call home, 40% are unwitnessed. And let's uh, look at uh, 2021. So in 2021, uh, we had a cause of death in the United States, about 700,000 died from heart disease, 600,000, 605,000 from cancer, and COVID, 415,000. This is uh, 2021. So things changed for COVID and not for anything else. So heart disease for last year, we had about 700,000 deaths, 607,000 cancers, we had COVID came down significantly from 415,000 to 188. It's still there. And an intentional injuries took the third place. An intentional injuries, car accidents, uh, accidental poisonings, uh, falls, uh, fires, uh, that type of thing. It's a very important cause of death, especially for younger people, less than 35. There's a lot of unintentional uh, injuries. And Putting this from a different perspective, if you have, uh, again, this is for 2022, he has heart disease, he has cancer, he has an intentional injury, COVID was number four, stroke was number five, dementia was number seven. Still uh, up there. Uh, and these are what's killing uh, as Americans. And in some cardiac death is essential, it's about a thousand deaths a day. So by the time we're done with this talk, 41 Americans passed away from sudden cardiac death. Here's the problem. Uh, the problem is, who is at risk of sudden cardiac death? People who are at risk of sudden cardiac death are people who already survived one episode. If you were lucky enough to have a cardiac arrest and you survived, so you are at risk of happening it again. If you had a heart attack and you had a lot of damage in your heart muscle, you are a high risk. And that's, you know, I spent my entire life as a electrophysiologist, essentially a, I'm an electrician for the heart. And we spent my entire life working on these guys, people who are at high risk, had a cardiac arrest already, had a bad heart, bad uh, pump, weak muscle, and a lot of damage. But if you look at the 700,000 people who died, and half of them suddenly, most of the people are not in this high risk. They are in the general population. Or they have some heart condition, but they are not candidates for any specific intervention or defibrillator. But this is the majority. So we are, uh, as electrophysiologists, we spend uh, our lives taking care of these people because we have data and we can do f things that, about it, but we're missing the majority. And what we do today is the most effective therapy for cardiac death is have an implantable defibrillator. Uh, 
sort of a pacemaker goes in a little bigger, it goes into the collarbone, the wiring goes inside the heart and um, detects what the heart is doing every single second. If it sees the racing, will automatically deliver a small shock and get you out of it. And we implant about more than 100,000 now fibrillators a year in the United States, quite a lot. And so what's the underlying cause of sudden cardiac death? 80% is coronary artery disease, is blockage in the arteries in the heart. So if we could get rid of the blockage of the arteries in the heart, sudden cardiac death will be a, a non-issue because 80% of the underlying cause is sudden cardiac death. There are other things, but we're not gonna uh, go into it. This is a very interesting slide. I'm not sure if you guys could see what this is published in uh, 2000 by Erica Frank, American Journal of Prevention medicine, and she looked at uh, mean age of death for, uh, for people who die between 84 and 95 in white men, black men, and they look at everybody. Let's look at the white guys. There were 3.3 million deaths in that decade. Uh, the mean age was 70.3. If you were a professional, you are 7.9, if we're a lawyer, 72.3, so you did a little better, you know? And uh, physicians, we, we beat the lawyers, but not by much, we're 73, I think. So we beat the lawyers a little bit, but not by much. Uh, if you look at black men, the all deaths, uh, the mean age was 63, the professionals were 65, the physicians, black, uh, man, physicians were 68, so almost a five-year gap between wh white and black. And I didn't know what happened to a black men and lawyers, but boy, they had a 10-year difference in uh, mortality, a mean age at death compared to white. So uh, it's quite dramatic, but obviously there is a big discrepancy. Uh, and uh, uh, remember, there, you should ask, there are no women over there, because there were no women. These are people who were born in 1900s, 1910s, and died you know, in this decade. And at that time, there was no women in medical school, zero. Today, 50% of medical students are women, maybe even more. So, but in 1910s, 1920s, uh, there was just nobody, no, no women in the, uh, medical school. Uh, so, but the, the bottom line is this, uh, the physicians' top 10 causes of death are the same as the general population. Uh, it's just not different. So, we're a little bit better in terms of uh, uh, the mean age of death, but not by much. And uh, because, you know, we do like everybody else, we work very hard, we just, uh, stress out, we uh, eat uh, the junk that everybody else does, and we're gonna die like everybody else. That's pretty much it. It's uh, not a mystery. And so the question is, do you have warning signs of a cardiac arrest? And you may have some, but they're not very good. And I'll tell you why. Let's go through some of these. Chest pain, you could have chest pain, uh, usually left precordial, going to the left shoulder, your jaw, your neck, or down the arms. Uh, the same as a heart attack, the symptoms. You could have trouble breathing. You could have uh, pounding and palpitations in the heart. Uh, you could have profuse sweating, the same as a heart attack. You could start sweating uh, for no apparent reason, not because you have a fever, you just uh, are in, uh, a lot of trouble when you see that happen. Uh, and, but then here's the key. The most common symptom, symptom of sudden crack death is sudden crack death. No, uh, no symptoms. So the sudden crack death is the first and many times the last symptom that you have. There is really no warning because all of the others that I showed, it could happen, but it's not that common. And are there uh, risk factors for uh, sudden cardiac death? Uh, there's a bunch of them, and we'll go over a bunch of these. 
So if you have more than five drinks a day, uh, it, it leads to ventricular arrhythmias and you uh, increase the risk of cardiac death. The uh, recommendations, if you drink, the recommendation is for men two drinks, for women one, uh, one drink a day, no more than that. Uh, but when you go uh, uh, more than five drinks a day, you actually, not only you could damage all kinds of things, including myocardium, you could damage your liver too, you could damage your pancreas and cause pancreatitis. And the interesting thing is we don't know um, who's gonna get what, because some people could drink a lot and never had a problem with the heart, but they destroyed the liver. And some people drink a lot and the liver is fine, but they destroy the pancreas and they have chronic pancreatitis and abdominal pains and stuff. And some people, uh, the liver is fine and the pancreas is fine and they get a uh, weakness in the heart muscle cardiomyopathy, I'll call it cardiomyopathy. Uh, and we don't know who is gonna get what. Just in case you didn't get the memo, this is not good. <laughs> not only increases the risk of you know, lung cancer, uh, oral cancer, esophageal cancer, bladder cancer, uh, and destroys your lungs with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. It also increases your risk of uh, sudden cardiac death. And uh, a positive point here, right now, in the United States, the rate of smoking has come down very dramatically. So it's still, you know, I think 20, 25% of Americans smoke, but way down from what used to be. Uh, stress is just not good for you, period. You know, this was taken from an actual study. They look at people who already have implanted defibrillators after 9-11 in New York City, and they had a bunch, a bunch of shocks, more than usual. And these are people if they didn't have the fibrillator, they would have a rest, a cardiac arrest. So uh, stress is just not good for you. And there is even a condition called uh, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy that mimics like a heart attack. And people in, you know, having chest pain and shortness of breath and sweating go to the emergency room and they take to the cat lab. EKG may look like a, a heart attack and you go to the cat lab and the arteries are open. And usually they have like a ballooning of the lower third of the, the heart. And this happens with extreme um, emotional distress. You, uh, loss of a loved one, you lost your job then you didn't uh, expect it or something really emotionally bad that actually thrashes on your, your myocardium and causes a lot of weakness. The good news is usually they recover after a, a, a couple of months, but not always. And this is not good for you either. Uh, you want to stay away from uh, cocaine yeah, because it does cause uh, uh, sudden cardiac death in young people, obviously. And if you have uh, kidney problems, it's just not that good for you either because 25% of uh, people who are on dialysis die suddenly. And interesting enough, usually, the threefold increase in the 12 hours before the next session, what tells us dialysis is not really a perfect replacement for your kidneys. So if you, you have two kidneys, if you can keep them, my suggestion is keep them. It's the best. Uh, dialysis keeps you alive, but it's not, uh, it's not that great. But it does you know, a good job. I, uh, when I did my internal medicine in New York City many years ago, we had a wall with lots of pictures. And that was, uh, this was 1986. Uh, uh, and people who were on dialysis and survived 10 years will take you a picture and splash on the, on the wall. So even that, back then, some people would live 10 years, but it was not that common. And the problem was the quality of life. At that time, the quality of life of people in the house was just terrible because they, they have a severe anemia, they couldn't fix it. Now we can fix that, they look a lot better. So exercise is great for you, but there's always a little bit of risks associated with it, especially with uh, uh, people who is known to have coronary artery disease. If you have a stress test, there is about one in 2,000 chances that you're gonna have a cardiac arrest. 
if you are in cardiac rehab, there's about one in 12,000 uh, people who have a cardiac arrest. Uh, but overall, the, ben the e benefits of exercise clearly outweigh the risk. And these are great places to have a cardiac arrest. If you can pick it, this is uh, the best. And I'll give you an example. This is in your, was in your office, and it's somebody who went into cardiac arrest during a stress test, obviously recovery zero. Whoever was watching this stopped immediately. The patient obviously you know, collapsed. And we shocked him and it was just back to normal. So and then when the hospital figured it out, it's fine. In uh, cardiac rehab, it's great because it's going to be witness and they, are, they have people there they can get you uh, out of it in uh, no time. It's a good. The other thing is a good place, uh, a good place to exercise, especially if you have some heart condition, is just the gyms. Because if you exercise in the gym, you're gonna be witness. You're gonna have somebody there. And most of the gyms now, maybe all of them, have a AED, external defibrillator there. Actually, I remember putting two defibrillators in young people. One had a cardiac arrest at Y, and one had a cardiac arrest, um, I think, in Custer, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so I try to uh, do what I preach. This is New Orleans, New Orleans at 10K. Uh, and let's talk about uh, this kid. Question is this, can you have a cardiac arrest in a perfectly normal heart? Because it's an exception. Most people have a good heart, so they don't go into cardiac arrest. But that's an exception. This is called commotio cordis. And essentially, it usually happens in kids, but some bigger kids, I'll show you. And if you're struck by a ball or, or a hockey puck on the chest, on a vulnerable period of the T wave, there's about 20 milliseconds. If your heart is going like a 60 beats per minute, it's taking about one second in between beats. One second is a thousand milliseconds. But at a thousand milliseconds, there's about 20 milliseconds. It's called the vulnerable period. And if you, uh, when you, you want to cause a cardiac arrest, that we did so many times to try the fibrillators, we just put a tiny shock on that part of the cardiac cycle. We could actually time it. And people go to ventricular fibrillation just like that. It's just very uh, reliable. So it happens also, uh, if you struck with a ball on the uh, precordium, if it happens to be in that uh, vulnerable period of the myocardium. It happens usually in little kids. And this is, uh, it was a teenager. This was in January in uh, 2023 from the news. Patrick, uh, he was playing hockey. He collapsed and he, he just, he didn't make it. They didn't have AED and it was gone. And you know this guy, uh, he was lucky too. I understand his back playing uh, uh, football. Uh, he, they documented, they excluded everything and they said they had commercial cordless. So uh, it was struck uh, during the game and led to a cardiac arrest. Very unusual, especially uh, on the, uh, at this age group. But uh, it, it has happened. So what can we do now? So we know most of the people who are gonna have a cardiac arrest are not at a higher risk, and we can't really put fibrillators or do much about it. So we, can we address it with other, other ways? And the answer is absolutely yes. And I'm gonna show you the data. And so <clears throat> let's look at, uh, what, can we prevent heart attacks with food? Let's look at nuts. The nut consumption, uh, and decrease risk of cardiac death in the physician's health study. Physician health study is a study done by the Harvard School of Public Health, and they been fo they followed 21,000 physicians for 17 years, and they look at people who had nuts two or more servings a week had a 47% reduction in sudden cardiac death. 47%, just two servings of uh, nuts a week. Uh, there's another study in California, Loma Linda, the Adventist Health Study. They've been uh, following 34,000 seven-day Adventists. And 
they look that people had not five or more servings a week. Uh, Tonic cardiac death decreased by 48%. Uh, my heart attacks by 51%. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. That's the best religion you can have because they live 10 years longer than the average American. 10 years. Uh, they are plant-based. They, they're, um, yeah, uh, my understanding is it's not required to be a plant-based to be a Seventh-day Adventist, but they push it. So actually, uh, only 10%, about 10% of the Seventh-day Adventists are actually vegans. Most of them are um, pesco vegetarian. They eat fish, and uh, but they uh, eat a lot uh, of you know plant-based diets and. Uh, uh, vegetables uh, and stuff and more fruits and vegetables but only actually uh, about 10% are actually vegans and uh, and there's a bunch of them like a third of them don't do uh, pay much attention to it do do like what everybody else does was well, great for the study because then they could compare them um, the different uh, 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 diets on the same group Brazil nuts Great, great for you. Uh, so they did a study and they gave a small study, but they gave four Brazil nuts to a bunch of young people and they uh, checked the blood uh, one hour, three hours, six hours, nine hours, 24, 48, uh, five days and 30 days. And they looked at the bad cholesterol, the LDL. And after nine hours, the bad cholesterol start going down and stay down for a month, 30 days. And, and here's the good cholesterol, the HDL, the high density lipoprotein cholesterol. Uh, around nine hours started going up and stayed up for 30 days. And they didn't give them every day. They just gave them one dose for Brazil nuts one time, and that was it. And then they followed the, the cholesterol for a month. You know, uh, pretty, uh, pretty dramatic. So what do nuts do? Uh, they actually lower blood pressure, obviously. They lower your bad cholesterol, increase the good one, and they improve the endothelial function, the uh, artery health, and uh, they lower uh, the risk of uh, sudden death. I made up this rule, my five rules when you're buying nuts, is two R's and three U's. You wanna buy raw, you wanna buy dry roasted, and you wanna make sure they don't add anything. No, don't add salt, don't add sugars, uh, and it should be unpeeled because they are healthy the way they can. We don't wanna uh, spoil them adding salt or more sugars. And, uh, it's kind of very important because actually I didn't know this. So this is peanuts, but 50% of the antioxidants are actually in this pellicle, this uh, uh, outer membrane, not this, not the big one, this one. This one. They really want, they don't want to throw this away because you're throwing 50% or more antioxidants of the nuts. It doesn't just apply to peanuts, all nuts. So you want to keep that uh, outer layer and uh, somehow incorporate it into your diet. And let's spice up uh, things a little bit. Uh, what about um, chili peppers? And you have on the, here you have the hot ones, the ghost and the habaneros, the ghost are up to a million Scoville units, pretty hot. But uh, on the other end, you have, you know, shishito and banana peppers that have very little heat. And you have the bell peppers here, the sweet peppers that don't have any heat. They still have some health benefit, but not as much as the, uh, the other ones who have some heat. So what's going on here? Let's look at a map of Italy and this area called Molise. By the way, this is Sardinia. Sardinia is very uh, important to us in lifestyle medicine because it's one of the blue zones in the world where uh, have the highest concentration of centenarians with a, 
very active life. But we're not gonna go to Sardinia today, we're just gonna stay in Molise. And they did a study, they followed 22,000 Italians for about eight years. And people uh, who had chili peppers four or more times a week, uh, they had 25% decrease in all-cause mortality, 45% cardiovascular, ischemic heart disease, strokes, minus 61%. Cancer was a little bit less, but did not reach statistical significance. But it's very dramatic. So what do they do? So, the, um, so what's going on with the chili peppers? What happens is they actually decrease your appetite. They decrease your appetite is gonna fight obesity. And if you season foods with uh, uh, peppers, you're actually gonna use less salt, so you're gonna have uh, uh, less uh, blood pressure. They improve response to insulin. They, they reduce oxidation of LDL and improve endothelial function. Tell you, besides the Italian study, there was a Chinese study where they following uh, half a million people. And people who had spicy food six to seven times a week also had decreased mortality, decreased heart disease. And they actually decreased cancer, and it was, this study was actually statistically significant. So what's going on with peppers? They have a substance called capsaicin. That's what a chemical that gives you the heat. And it's good for you. And they have other things. They have other antioxidants, flavonoids and carotenoids. And so this stuff is just good for you. They, again, decrease your appetite, lower your blood pressure, and uh, improve the endothelial function. So uh, how do you buy chili peppers? Uh, the rule is this. Fresh are better than dried. Dried are better than the sauces. So the hot sauces. So you want to buy fresh. If you can, if not dried, if not the sauce, but fresher, the better. And uh, it's actually kind of important because uh, this applies to any food. Closer you are to uh, the soil where it comes out and less processed, better off you are. Uh, absolutely, this I think we could say for practically any, any food because even when, if you, get something from California, by the time it gets here, uh, you lose some properties along the way. So fresher, the better, for sure. And the, if you don't like the heat, even the sweet peppers are beneficial, but not as good as the other uh, one. And here's the highlight of this presentation is you just don't want to look at just look for a miracle or something, a food or something, because it's really uh, not the way to go. You want to look at the overall picture. And this is a, a low risk, healthy lifestyle, a risk and death among women. And this is the nurses' health study. There is three of them, uh, one, nurses' health study one, two, and three, but this is the one. And they looked at 121,000 nurses and they followed them until they died or until June of 2010. And here's what they defined as the low risk lifestyle. Don't smoke. Make sure your weight is normal. You have a body mass index uh, normal, less than 25. You exercise 30 minutes a day. And they then define a better diet. They define a, a score on the Mediterranean diet, essential oil, more fruits, more vegetables, more nuts, whole gra grains, some fish, and low intake of red and processed meat. They didn't eliminate, but it was less than everybody else. And if they adhere to these four parameters, they had 81%, let me repeat, 81% decrease in sudden cardiac death. Very, very, um, very uh, dramatic indeed. And uh, uh, the, the question is, how many nurses are doing that? <laughs> and I'll uh, answer at the end of the lecture, if you ask me. <laughs> Let's just say a word about um, COVID. Uh, they looked at the study at uh, people who were plant-based, uh, uh, Piscatarians, and uh, in six countries here and in Europe, and they look at 500 physicians and nurses 
who were expecting, they were exposed to COVID and got COVID because, you know, just whatever we do. And they look at who got sick or the sickest. And the reality is uh, people who are on a plant-based diet had uh, uh, 72 percent less risk of developing severe COVID. If you ate fish and plant, you were 61% uh, less likely. If you were on a low carb, high protein diet, this is essentially like keto diet, uh, uh, the Atkins diet, they all the same, or the Banting diet, uh, you actually had more than 50% higher risk of not only getting COVID, but getting into uh, trouble, uh, uh, needing a lot of oxygen or being intensive, put in intensive care unit. And then interesting because there is a, uh, Dr. Kim Williams, who was at the time was in Chicago, uh, and was also the president of the American College of um, Cardiology a couple of years ago. He actually told us that uh, he was not aware, and this was not a study, but they had a lot of COVID in Chicago at the rush where the hospital says we didn't had any vegan who came in that was really sick, we even with COVID. Uh, why? Because they, uh, people on plant-based, they have a higher, a bad immune system. You just fight this stuff. And let's say a word about these guys. So my favorite one, Doc, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Bill Banting. Bill was, uh, was born in uh, 1796 and he was an uh, undertaker and he was pretty obese in London. And he, uh, his physician uh, just came from Paris at the time from a conference. And there was some guy, uh, physiologist in France, in Paris, who was pushing uh, a very low carb diet. And it, it, essentially, it, it's the, the same thing as the Atkins or uh, the keto diet. And in fact, Mr. Banting lost a ton of weight and it felt a lot better. And he actually wrote a paper uh, on the corpulence to the general public. He wrote a paper uh, because he was so excited about it and it worked for him. Uh, but he lost the weight. Who's this guy here in the middle? Very famous cardiologist. He had the most famous diet ever. And his business just exploded. At one point, I understand he had a revenue of $100 million. Who is he? Dr. Atkins. Robert Atkins, the cardiologist, he was in New York City, and essentially what he did, he did, he did the same thing as Mr. Banting did. It, it, there is really no difference, just names and uh, updated stuff, but uh, it, it's a very low carb, uh, high protein, high fat diet. You eat all the meats, all the, uh, all the eggs, uh, uh, everything. And in fact, uh, he was so successful because you lose weight, you bring your blood pressure down, you bring your cholesterol down, and you, you know, if, if you have diabetes, you know, things get better. If you measure hemoglobin, you won't see all the parameters, everything looks better yet it's going to kill you faster than if you didn't do that. So it's very confusing because even today there are physicians who still push, think the keto diet is the way to go, and it is. If your goal is to fit into a small coffin, it's perfect <laughs> because, uh, because it works. You lose the weight, but in reality, the uh, weight loss should never be your goal. Weight loss should be a consequence, a side effect of your healthy lifestyle. And I can tell you, this is a very powerful um, statement, but it's true. In medicine, uh, we want, do you want to think that lower your blood pressure? You say, yeah, I mean, if I have high blood pressure, I want to think lower blood pressure. Do you want something that lower your cholesterol? Yeah, sounds good. Do you want something that lowers your blood sugar if you have diabetes? You say, yeah, yeah, sounds good. 
but these are called soft endpoints because we do have medications uh, even for diabetes and for high blood pressure that do all those things but actually increase your mortality. So we don't want that. You really want hard endpoints. You want less strokes, less heart attacks, uh, you know, less peripheral vascular disease, less kidney function. It doesn't really matter. The numbers uh, are just, they're good, but they are not the, the, really what you want. It's not the final result. And you could have medications that does these things uh, and then increases your, your mortality. In diabetes, we had it for many years. And it's hard to figure this out because it takes many years to, uh, to tease out uh, what's going on. And from the FDA perspective at that time, and I'm not sure what's going on today, but if you want a, a, a drug to lower your blood pressure to be approved, you say, you prove the lowers your blood pressure, they'll approve. Uh, you could do for eight weeks or 12 weeks, but really it's not what you want. You want to harden points, and it takes a lot more work, a lot more years to figure these things out. And the same thing with the diet. He's another cardiologist uh, 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 here, uh, Dr. Dean Ornish. And uh, they're both cardiologists, but Atkins was wrong and uh, Dean Ornish is right. So uh, that's the bottom line. So uh, Dean Ornish was a, a medical student in uh, Texas and uh, he was a little bit of a troublemaker. So <laughs> Dr. DeBeek is actually a true story. Tried to kick, kick him out of medical school because he took a year off and he did a study where they put people on a plant-based diet, uh, controlling stress, uh, doing yoga and meditation. And then they actually take them to the cath lab and looked at the blockage and they proved many decades ago that the blockage actually decreased. And it took the, um, a lot of years, but more than 10 years uh, ago, actually, he uh, convinced Medicare. Medicare to approve his system. It's called intensive cardiac rehab. If you had a heart attack, if you had a, a bypass surgery, if you had a stent, you qualify. Medicare actually pays for his program. And unfortunately, there are not many in the country. We don't have anyone here. There is, to my knowledge, no. We have cardiac rehab, but not intensive cardiac rehab. We don't have any in the four states around us. Any yet. Uh, so, in conclusion, so heart disease has been a number one killer since the Spanish flu, period. Yeah. It, it's been that bad. And Sudden cardiac death is the first manifestation in 50% of the cardiac death. And the majority occurs in people who are so-called a low risk. They are not candidates for fibrillators or other interventions. And uh, we now now have the data, lifestyle changes will, can cut the risk significantly as we've seen in the nurses health study. So you don't want to wait for the first symptom because often it's often the last. And as Dr. Dean Ornish says, all you have to do is eat well, uh, move more, stress less, and love more. That's the recipe. So if you can do that, you will uh, do very well and prolong your uh, longevity and your quality of life as well.